Well, let me uh, begin by welcoming uh, all of you to the uh, Empirical Legal Research Network uh, and uh, the colloquium that we're organizing today. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the Empirical Legal Research Network is the University of Edinburgh's um, hub or nexus for those scholars, both postgraduate students and, and academic staff members who have an interest in empirical research uh, and the study of law and society. The ELRN holds events at the University of Edinburgh uh, throughout the academic year. And for those of you uh, who have participated in our recent events, you might recall that in mid-October this past year, we held the um, um, Empirical Legal Research Festival and ELRN training workshop, which consisted of sessions on qualitative and quantitative approaches to empirical legal research, human rights and empirical legal research, and studying law in everyday life. So we had some wonderful speakers, uh, Lisa Webley from the University of Birmingham, uh, Helen Tyrell from Newcastle University, Jack Cunliffe of University of Kent, and uh, Simon Halliday, University of York. And then we had our annual lecture, as we've done the past several years, and that was uh, led by uh, Professor Ambrina Manji of Cardiff University. So that was a very successful event. What we've also done in the past years is hold um, colloquia uh, every year, where we uh, have a showcase of recently completed or ongoing empirical legal research conducted by uh, students and staff at the University of Edinburgh uh, and to that end we are absolutely delighted to have four presentations today um, starting with uh, Dr. Jonathan Hardman who's a lecturer in international commercial law um, and um, I, I, I'll go with Dr. Uh, Nick, Nick Rowell, I, I apologize if, if I've not got that right, um, who's with the Senior Sky Survey uh, and He's a researcher in the, with the Senior Sky Survey and part of the School of Physics uh, and Astronomy. And they'll start and then um, how the process uh, will, will go is um, each speaker will have about 15-20 minutes to present their, their research and then there'll be a Q&A period that will follow and then we'll go to the next speaker and I'll make those introductions uh, following following the first presentation. But let us begin with, um, with Johnny and Nick. So over to you both and uh, because you're moderators you should be able to share uh, your, your screen and your slides uh, if you have any, but uh, I'll let you conduct uh, uh, the next little while. If there's any issues, just uh, drop me notes in the chat. Thanks, Ted. Um, our slides should now be uh, uh, be available. Um, if anyone can't see them, uh, please let me know. We can, uh, we can send them afterwards. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, allowing us to, uh, to come and talk about our uh, interdisciplinary empirical project today uh, called the director daisy chain for uh, uh, for reasons that will become apparent shortly so this is interdisciplinary in that it, uh, it, it it consists of both law which is what i bring to the uh, uh, bring to the collaboration and data science which is what nick brings to the collaboration um it's probably important to, to mention um how this got started. Um, and Nick and I are actually cousins um, and socialize together quite a bit as well. We realized that there was a big opportunity here in that the UK corporate database, Companies House, at which various information about all companies is recorded, has recently become publicly available um, through a couple of methods we'll talk about in a second. In addition to becoming uh, publicly available. Uh, they also uh, set up a, 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 a specific way for developers to access the contents of the database um, using uh, uh, using programs to, to to run specific queries. We realised that this was such an untapped mine um, of uh, uh, of great information about about what companies in the UK are doing that uh, we should definitely try to combine our skills. Uh, to work out exactly what was going on uh, with certain UK companies. So initially, our initial scoping aim was to work out what we could do. I have absolutely no technological knowledge at all in the slightest. Nick does have technological knowledge, but no knowledge of the corporate law landscape. And so over the course of that project, we uh, uh, um, we st started quite uh, uh, quite iteratively scoping out exactly what was possible and what it would mean until we came to uh, a realization that, uh, that there was one particular area uh, that we could uh, we could really contribute to the field in. So we really started, we identified that and started it in December 2019. It's now very nearly finished and hoping to uh, uh, be submitted for publication this summer. And so the 
topic that we specifically chose was independent non-executive directors, known as INEDs for short. Um, excuse me, my puppy has just come in with a squeaky toy. Uh, two seconds. Um, so INEDs are a mainstay of international corporate governance um, and listed companies throughout the, uh, throughout the country uh, and throughout the world uh, appoint independent non-executive directors. There's a series of advantages that are said to apply to an independent non-executive director. So this is a director who isn't involved in the day-to-day -day management of the company and is instead an outsider brought in to act as a, di uh, as a director in order to help the company function more efficiently. So the advantages that are said of appointing INED so that they act as a check and balance on, ex on executive directors and as such they prevent managerial opportunism. As a result uh, uh, they reduce agency costs suffered by shareholders within the company and this is one of the main um, uh, research areas and research agendas for corporate law research more broadly this concept of agency costs. So INEDs are said to reduce agency costs. They also are meant to provide strategic guidance to the company um, and provide a signal from, a, uh, from the executive directors that those executive directors are willing to be monitored and that they can find people who are willing to act as monitors for them. So there's a series of theoretical advantages that are, uh, are stated for independent directors. There's also a number of disadvantages that are stated for them as well. Um, in particular, one of the main disadvantages that are stated of them is that they're subject to cronyism, that executive directors don't appoint properly independent directors, but instead they appoint those directors who they already know. And as such, what they're really trying to do is, uh, uh, is comply with the letter of the uh, requirements for independent non-executive directors, but not the substance. In addition to the challenge of cronyism, that is that independent non-executive directors are too close to the directors, uh, to the executive directors that they're meant to oversee, there's also a challenge that they're in hoc to their system, that what the entire process of independent non-executive non directors is encouraging is um, the, uh, uh, the entire system being interconnected in a very uh, broad way. So that whilst they might be efficient at, uh, at stopping um, uh, 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 managerial opportunism for one specific company, nevertheless they're systematically involved in corporate governance because they're directors of other companies and as such they're all very connected and systemic issues that affect the entire market won't be protected by this system. And it's these two disadvantages, there are other disadvantages as well, that we really wanted to focus our empirical research on. And so these are the two things that we try to test in this project. So first of all, we had to get the data and we got the data from a number of sources. Firstly, Companies House, the, the start of this project. Um, there's three ways to access Companies House. Firstly, there's a public facing platform that lets you search for one company and produces outcomes for one company. That's helpful if you know exactly what company you want to find uh, and, and precisely the information that you're looking for and the specific appointments and data, but it's less useful um, for, um, uh, uh, for broader uh, uh, searches of the system. Companies House does publish a monthly free data product, but that doesn't produce or include everything that, that's helpful, including it doesn't actually list out all the directors of each company at any given moment. And so that's not particularly helpful either. Companies House does have an API, though, that can be tapped into, uh, subject to a cap of, uh, of a certain amount of, uh, of queries an hour, which we managed to, uh, to get them to increase slightly, but not majorly. So in terms of who are directors of which companies, we were able to get that information from Companies House and their API. We then needed to work out which companies we wanted to look at. And the rules regarding independent non-executive directors are really applicable for publicly listed companies. And so we looked at the London Stock Exchange. They produce a monthly issuer list. So that's those who've issued securities onto the uh, uh, London Stock Exchange. And we wanted to only look at the main market of, that, of the London Stock Exchange. And that's because the rules governing INEDs are really only in place for the main market. 
So we then took a we took that list and we cross referenced it against Companies House and its API, and that gave us 767 relevant companies to find, which between them had 4,986 directorships. We then needed to find out which directors were deemed to be independent. That's, this is a, a subjective decision undertaken by the company. They decide whether each of their directors is independent or not, based on a list of non-exhaustive criteria that the company are free to disregard if they like. But how to actually find out who which company thought were their independent directors? Well, to do that, we had to take a look at manually the company's uh, publications. It's primarily listed in its annual report, um, produced up to four months after the end of a financial year. Um, that report is where uh, they're meant to explain who their independent directors are. But of course, there's a time lag between the appointment of directors and these publications coming out. And so we had to uh, fill those gaps by looking at websites and regulatory announcements. Also, the governance requirements for close-ended investment funds. These are companies that really act as if they're investment funds, often called investment trusts have an entirely different governance system and an entirely different setup, and therefore we had to filter um, uh, for AIC members, uh, or filter for closed-ended investment funds, and there's an association of closed-ended investment funds called the Association of Investment Companies. And so we also filtered for AIC members, although we won't go into detail on this um, uh, split out between AIC and non-AIC membership. So in terms of how we actually accessed the company's house API in the next few start slides, I'll hand over to Nick. Okay, thanks, uh, Johnny. I assume you can hear me okay. Um, yeah, so the Companies House API um, enables uh, electronic access to the Companies House database um, where individual data resources are assigned unique URLs that are accessible and, and retrievable um, by issuing HTTP requests. Uh, the data itself is, is provided in this JSON format, which is a a uh, standard for data um, storage and exchange that's very flexible and, and simple to use. Uh, ultimately, this has to all be done electronically. Um, we needed to write a, a piece of software to, to do this. We um, wrote an application in the Java programming language, um, the code for which is on GitHub if anybody's interested in looking it up. Um, so ultimately, um, via the API, we can retrieve numerous types of record from the company's house database, um, only a few of which are really of relevance to this study. These are uh, firstly uh, the uh, company uh, records. So these are indexed by the unique company number. Um, they also contain information on the company type, uh, status, the name, etc. So these were supplemented by our auxiliary data sets of, uh, from the uh, London Stock Exchange issuers list and the AIC membership list. So we, uh, we also were interested in the officer records. So for each company, you can retrieve the records of the individual officers that uh, are appointed. So th these include the officer's name, date of birth, address, et cetera, rather inconsistently as we found out. And actually multiplicity was a, a problem. Many officers are recorded in the database more than once incorrectly, in um, actually around 10% of all records we, we found. Uh, and it was important to detect and, and resolve these cases because otherwise it would result in, in, in failing to connect up um, separate instances of the same individual and would, would, would bias the, the network that we're, we're building. So we, we had to mo mostly manually um, match officers according to names and, and dates of birth um, where, where the, this information was recorded and, and ultimately all ambiguous cases were, were resolved. So we're then also interested in the uh, appointments records from the database. So each appointment record contains the details of, uh, well, the appointment of one officer at one company. They record the officer role, which allows us to filter out uh, non-directorships. And these appointments records are supplemented by our directorship status data set that Johnny described, which allows to distinguish between uh, the independent and, and non-independent directorships. So we can proceed in this way uh, through our list of companies and retrieve all of the, the officers and their appointments. Um, and by uh, matching the, the officers of different companies, we can um, merge these records and, and 
build the the, the interconnections that are really the, the core of, of this project and allow us to derive this network of, of companies and, and offices. Uh, and so the company and office network that we're describing actually has the um, structure of a mathematical uh, graph. So a graph in this context has quite a different meaning to what you might be familiar with. And the, the mathematical graph is actually an object composed of uh, vertices that are connected by edges. Uh, the vertices in this case are the, the companies and offices and the, the edges of the, the directorships that link them. And graphs that are used to model pairwise relationships between objects. And representing our, our network as a, as a graph allows us to, to really leverage a lot of powerful methods and algorithms from uh, graph theory to inspect the, the structure in a, a kind of formalized manner. And so for this purpose, we adopted a particular graph theory software library called JGraphT, which is, is used very widely in uh, academic research and uh, industry for you know, things like electrical circuits, uh, traffic flow, and um, this kind of thing. Uh, so just to summarize some of the results, uh, starting at a, a high level, just some basic statistics from our, our resulting graph. So we, um, we have 767 companies, um, 4,123 uh, individual directors, um, which between them hold uh, 4,986 directorships. Uh, so these directorships break down into around 3,600 independent directorships and around 1,400 uh, non-independent ones. Um, so it's, it's clear that there, there are more directorships than there are directors and that a significant number of individuals must hold more than one simultaneously. And just looking at the, the, the breakdown of, of, of this, um, this plot shows the number of directorships held simultaneously by individuals, uh, broken down by directorship type. And what, what it reveals is a strong tendency for uh, independent directorships to be held uh, multiple uh, times by the same in individual. Um, for, for example, uh, we found there are 375 individuals that hold two independent directorships simultaneously, uh, but only uh, 13 individuals that hold two non-independent directorships simultaneously. So another way to inspect the graph is to look at how it breaks down into isolated uh, islands or, or, or groups of companies and offices that are disconnected from the rest. Um, so these are referred to as connected sets. Uh, this diagram here shows an, an example. Uh, the whole thing is, is the graph and the two kind of islands that it breaks down into are the connected sets consisting of uh, well, two companies on the left and, and three companies on the right. Um, and the, the, the distribution of size of these connected sets gives us a good picture of how interconnected the, the graph is as a whole. Uh, so this is the distribution of size of the connected sets that we found. It's in tabulated because it's highly skewed, but ultimately what we found is that in 159 connected sets that contain only one company. So these are isolated companies with no interconnections with, with others through their directorships. Then there are 14 sets that contain um, just two companies, uh, for example. Uh, I should add that uh, these uh, th this is computed um, using both directorship types to compute the connected sets. And really the interesting thing to note here is this last line where we find that actually the great majority of companies, 550, reside in one enormous uh, in connected set. Uh, things get quite interesting when we break it down by directorship type. So this is the same thing, just split by directorship type in the, the top the upper table is, is when only independent directorships are used to compute the connected sets. And the basic picture is still very much the same. 521 of the companies um, are all interconnected. Uh, whereas in the lower table, when only non-independent directorships are used to compute the connected sets, the com picture is completely reversed. And now um, 731 are isolated with, with no interconnections. Uh, so it, it seems that the presence of the independent directorships um, significantly increases the, the interconnectedness of, of companies. Uh, finally, just to wrap up this results section, um, 
we also looked at the length of the shortest path between pairs of directors, which is a, a useful metric to quantify um, how closely two directors are, are connected. Um, the, the path length in this context is essentially the, the number of intermediate companies that lie between two directors in the graph along, along the shortest uh, path between the two. Um, and the distribution over the shortest path length for over all the pairs of directors quantifies how um, densely connected the overall graph structure is. Um, and this is uh, a plot on showing the, the histogram of shortest path lengths that we found. Um, so this varies from the, low, uh, the lower end, the path length of one, which corresponds to two directors that hold directorships at the same company, and there's only one company between them, uh, all the way up to 14, which is the longest, uh, shortest path that we found, um, where you know, two, a pair of directors has a sequence of 14 companies in between them, so you know, they're very distantly connected. Uh, and actually, the, the, the median path length that we found is six. So um, if you pick a pair of directors at random, 50% of the time, there'll be uh, six or, or fewer companies lying between them. And 50% of the time, there'll be uh, seven or more companies. Um, and we figured that six is actually quite long. And it, it seems that actually, on average, um, pairs of directors are, are quite distantly uh, linked in, in the graph. Um, but I'll, I'll hand back to, to Johnny to um, discuss some of the, the implications of, of all this. So yeah, we, we thought there were three main um, uh, implications of this. Firstly, that the data was surprisingly hard to find. Considering that INEDs are such an important part of the corporate governance framework, um, there seems to be a case for, uh, for companies having a, a, a publishing at, uh, at all times who their current INEDs are. Um, to be able to verify that if uh, if two people actively looking to research in the field found it so difficult to find out which which directors were treated as independent within any company, then what chance does a retail investor have uh, looking across the uh, uh, looking to invest in a company? And so the first issue we think is the space for simplifying the publication of that information, not least so I don't have to go through 776 um, sets of annual accounts again. To delve to page 87 to work out who who the INEDs were listed at, at any given time, but in terms of the uh, the more empirical stuff, uh, more empirical results, we didn't find an evidence of cronyism, and that's because uh, we've got quite a long um, uh, uh, shortest path with between of, of kind of six and seven. So if we if cronyism was the case, we'd expect a series of very short shortest paths in which directors were keen to get. Uh, um, as, as close to independent directors with whom, uh, or appoint independent directors with whom they had strong directorship links with anyway. And so the fact that we've got quite a long average uh, shortest path tells us that there isn't any evidence of cronyism. We've got to take that with a slight pinch of salt because we only included current appointments. So if we include historic appointments, they're more likely to be more links between them and therefore the shortest paths are likely to get a little bit shorter. We only included director appointments and therefore any other role such as a non-director manager or a company secretary uh, within a company um, or simply being employed by the company are not included by that. And we also didn't and we don't think we could include personal relationships so whether directors are party uh, are members of the same golf club went to the same school went to the same university send their children to the same school etc etc has been thought to have compromised independent in fact if not in law uh, but that's very difficult to quantify and include so we found no evidence of cronyism but we excluded a lot and so if, if that uh, if everything else was included perhaps there'd be more example of cronyism what we did find was a giant 550 long director danger, uh, daisy chain connecting 550 of the 600 uh, sorry 767 companies that are listed on the main market of the UK uh, UK companies that are listed on the main market of the London Stock Exchange in other words, whilst, uh, and, and this is caused entirely by independent directorships. So whilst mandating the appointment of an independent director may gain independence from that management, it doesn't gain independence from the system as a whole. In other words, it might stop that management doing something that is different from what the entire market does, but it won't stop them doing things that are systemic across the market. 
And so when we look at things like issues with diversity, when we look at things like um, uh, excessive executive remuneration and a lack of sustainability that are endemic across the market in the same way as in the run up to 2008, um, a lack of nous amongst um, uh, directors of banks was said to be systemic across the market um, or, or, or the risk caused by them was certainly systemic. Um, we don't think INEDs can play a role in doing that. Appointing an INED might help you manage, uh, stop your managers doing something that nobody else does, but it won't stop them uh, doing things that everyone is doing. And so as such, we think that this research unveils quite an important empirical insight into the role that independent directors can and should play within the field of wider corporate governance.